right, well, I'm going to get us started. Um, it's absolutely my delight to introduce Enrique Suarez, who's here for the Create Seminar. And I'm going to tell you a little, some fun things about Enrique. <laughs> so did you know he grew up in Venezuela so, and came to the United States, and he was a physicist for a while. So he uh, did a degree in physics from um, the University of Oklahoma and then ended up doing astrophysics research or, and cosmology research for five years, right? But, and then moved, transitioned from that into science education and got a master's from Tufts um, and then proceeded on to a PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Colorado at Boulder where he made a lot of friends who are physicists still and so that's a nice connection. Um, and then he ended up doing a postdoc at the College of Education at the University of Washington um, and uh, did some great work there. He studies a lot of work around equitable environments for students and teachers, um, helping them know more, students and teachers know more about the natural world through investigation. Um, he's really interested in designing learning environments that create opportunities, especially for elementary age kids. Um, emerging multilingual students can leverage their resources um, and train translanguaging practices, which is something I'm really interested in knowing more about as well. He also works with pre-service and in-service teachers and how they can work with their students around sense making, repertoire, and he teaches methods courses and does PD for teachers and work with physics education at the K-12 level. But I want to tell you some fun facts also. He has lived in all continental time zones in the U.S., he said. <laughs> um, enjoys cooking at Arepas for family and friends. His comfort food is South Asian food. And his favorite activity, especially lately, that is not required is reading. And the two books he's been reading lately are The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which sounds really interesting to me, and The Secret Life of Trees, which I've also heard is really good. George Haskell, yeah. That's awesome. So welcome, Henry. Yeah, thank you, Christina, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Christina, David, Ligita, Joe, and everybody at the Create um, for STEM Institute for having me. It's really um, an honor to be here with you all uh, amongst friends and colleagues who I really respect and, and, and admire. So it's, it's really special to be here today. Uh, before I get started, I also want to acknowledge that we are gathered in Anishinaabeg lands. Um, you know, sort of like the, the Three Fires Confederacy of the Ojibwe, um, Odawa, and Potawatomi, um, sort of like peoples and their relations. I was really excited to do some research about like um, initiatives and efforts within MSU around indigenous um, cultural resurgence. Um, and I found, of course, the, the, uh, the work that Dr. Kyle Powis White has been doing around eco, um, eco justice and education, super, super fascinating. And then I know that the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Department is doing some work around um, education with the Lansing Di School District, which I think was also like a, a really great um, effort. So just ways, opportunities of supporting Indigenous res uh, resurgence and um, cultural resurgence here in the state and here at the institution. So um, the work that I'm going to be presenting on today is kind of like a little bit of what I have been doing for the past 10 years. It's been a bit of soul searching and trying to figure out uh, what I do and what I care about. And it's really about like, how is it that uh, we can provide opportunities for emerging bilingual students to problematize physical phenomena through leveraging their um, communicative resources. And I'll open that up a little bit. But first, you know, when I think about science as a scientist, um, I... I, I was telling Christina about this book that I read a few years ago, actually more like 10 years ago, about uh, ignorance and how really the work that scientists do is to pose questions and to ask more questions. This is not about factual accumulation. This is not about writing textbooks, but it's about what this thing that he calls highly refined ignorance. It's a state of not knowing and, uh, and that being a good productive state. And I think that it pairs nicely with this uh, quote from Isaac Asimov where he says that the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, I found it, but hmm, that's funny, right? So I think that, you know, it's this that's funny that a lot of our uh, sort of like most recent reform efforts have focused on, sort of like how do we design our learning environments we're figuring out is what we're doing, right? But the reality is that that's not what happens in all of schools, right? So we exist in a society where students from certain backgrounds have more or less opportunities to learn 
because of the ways that we organize learning. And I think that this is really nicely summarized here from the um, LIFE report that came out a little over 10 years ago, where it says, you know, results in very different lived experiences that include unequal learning opportunities, challenges, uh, and potential risks uh, for learning development based on sort of like who you are, where your position is in, uh, in, in the world. So what to me, you know, sort of like thinking about figuring out and these sort of like unequal learning opportunities, especially in science learning environments with emerging bilingual students, the question is, oh my goodness, you know, like for me, the challenge is how do we re how do we disrupt these kind of like remedial approaches to STEM learning, where uh, researchers and educators are thinking of students' experiences and sort of like ways of thinking as being disconnected or unrelated to STEM. How is it that uh, the ideas and ways of knowing and ways of communicating that students bring to the classroom as being deficient? How is it that the students' primary ways of communicating are seen as obstacles? And to me, this is really captured in this like overemphasis on the acquisition of quote unquote STEM vocabulary, which it's represented here by my, um, by my nemesis, the, the word wall. <laughs> Um, which, you know, again, it, it, it poses the question for me, like, how is it that all of these attitudes are really end up marginalizing emerging multilingual students uh, in the science learning environments because of the distinctions that they make? So what I'm going to try and do today is really try like open up a little bit of like that complexity of sense making that some emerging bilingual students uh, or the ones that I, I will be sharing with you today engage in when they are trying to make sense of like these like, complex natural phenomena both in informal and informal spaces. How is it that you know, we can think about the design features of like what are the aspects of the elements of learning environments that can promote this kind of uh, reasoning for emerging bilingual students? And also thinking about like, what do we need to do at the theoretical level, at the uh, methodological level, at the pedagogical level that can support these kinds of changes to support our students? So you know, just to give you a little bit about myself, as Christina said, uh, I was a cosmologist, did uh, barren acoustic oscillations research for about five years, which is, let me see if I do this right. Yeah, so it's kind of like around like here, this part of the end of like this corner. Um, and I, I loved it. It was really, really exciting. But to me, like when I think about, you know, if you really want to think about the apple pie of my career, then you have to go back to Sagan. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s and he was sort of like a little late to come to Venezuela. But I, I was fascinated by this idea that you as a scientist could support not just sort of like our understanding of the world and how we relate to the universe, but invite other people into that endeavor. Right. So like that's what he dedicated his career to um, of making sure that people saw the beauty and the joy of knowing like where they are in the universe and how they relate to the universe and actually being seeing themselves as being able to ask those questions regardless of whether you're a scientist or engineer you can ask yourself questions about what's happening out there um, in a way that I didn't really experience in a lot of my classes so you know in 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 wanting to make, in wanting to help people see themselves as asking those questions I, I've spent the past 10 years chasing a, a lot of questions around you know, sort of like equitable science and teaching and learning again, because not everybody is supported um, in that endeavor, particularly around sort of like how do we design again these kind of uh, learning environments that support complex sense making? Um, how is it that we support teachers to expand their capacity and how we can learn from teachers ourselves uh, to do that kind of work? And again, you know, focusing a lot on student thinking and learning. And this is kind of like where I'm going to be spending a lot of the, of the time today. So, you know, just to kind of like open it up, you know, the questions that got my work is, you know, like, what are the qualities of how emerging bilingual students problematize phenomena? So I, I'm really interested in kind of like mechanistic reasoning. Um, is it, how is it that the students are using their communicative resources as they engage in these kinds of epistemic practices? And then like, what do we need to do to support um, educators uh, identify those resources and bring them into their instruction? And even though I've separated them here, for you know, kind of like um, analytical purposes, I see them all as sort of like related into each other. But when I think of learning, I think that there are different ways of, of conceptualizing what it means to learn. I think that there's definitely kind of like a cognitive, a behavioral, a social, cultural, affective, political, historical, and even sort of like ethical dimension of learning, right? So this is a really complex um, 
process, but I come at it from a kind of like a sociocultural perspective. When I think of learning and development as being kind of like a series of these processes that relate to shifts in participation in activity, in the kinds of, again, activities that are sanctioned or, seem product or deemed productive by spe uh, specific communities, but also a reconstitution of those activities, right? So like this is not about calcifying um, disciplines or calcifying practices, especially when it comes to trying to disentangle like education from processes of oppression and marginalization. Because um, as you know, I, the quote that I shared earlier from Dr. Banks says, there are ways in which power comes into play in our pedagogy, in our learning design, uh, that I think is really, really important to attend to. Especially, again, when we're thinking of figuring out and, and sort of like promoting the, hmm, that's funny type of attitude, like how is it that we can really promote this kind of like complex intellectual activity in learning environments and positioning students as knowers, as agents, rather than recipients of kind of like some remediation, right? And I don't, um, my, my grad school self would laugh at me right now, but I don't mean re-hyphen mediation, not, not remediation, but remediation, right? Like there's something wrong that needs to be um, addressed. And I think that this is captured nicely um, in the framework, at least chapter 11 um, of the framework where we're trying to think of learning as a cultural process, specifically science, learning, and engineering as related to the students' everyday experiences, interests, and identities. Thinking of how is it that our learning is more meaningful and teaching and learning are more meaningful when we leverage uh, students' values, knowledges, practices, ways of being, knowing, and valuing, right? Especially in ways that are connected to who they are in relation to their family and their communities. And again, sort of like how is it that our learning environments should really um, invite students' communicative resources and see them as valuable. Um, and I, will, I think I'll, I'll make a distinction later, but not right now, but see them as valuable for their own sake. And I think that, again, this is, I don't know if you've seen this graph before. It's very obscure, but yeah. <laughs> um, but, but I think that you know, the practices is, to me, like where we have a lot of leverage in making these kinds of changes. Because while you know, we can debate about cross-cutting concepts and, and the DCIs, I think that, that the practices in and of themselves can be, again, reconstituted, re-hyphen mediated to include, um, invite a lot of these sort of like ways of knowing that uh, we may be missing out from the people who are in the room or because of the people who have been historically in the room. And, and to me, you know, I always, I, I, I always go back to Freire and thinking of like, how is it that we need to disrupt a banking model of pedagogy where we see students as recipients right, of, of this like structure of learning, especially in a way that configures power in learning environments. And also thinking of like, we're not in the business of producing sameness, right? So like we're not, equity is not about making sure that everybody ends up in the same physics department, right? But instead, again, how do we remediate, how do we reconstitute these practices in ways that allow for more of these sort of like repertoires of practice and repertoires of being to come into contact with each other to promote uh, more kinds of meaningful um, learning and participation. And I think that, you know, to me, the work of, um, of Anne Roseberry and Beth Waring around epistemic heterogeneity, it's so important because it really pushes us to think about how is it that these like heterogeneous meaning, meaning, pra uh, meaning making practices can come into contact to create new pathways into learning that are more robust, that are more meaningful, that are really equitable, and again, disrupt that kind of like power structure both within <coughs> classrooms and even just sort of like at the disciplinary level, right? So may it be in how they're understanding, uh, you know, sort of germs in their community uh, as they are trying to understand their relationship to uh, lands and waters, and you know, as they also they're designing sort of like problems uh, or solutions to problems that um, relate to the things that they ma that matter to them in their community. So just kind of like trying to like summarize it a little bit. I think that within this sort of like learning through participation larger framework, I see my work within science education trying to like straddle the line of like productive disciplinary engagement, where students author uh, or problematize knowledge and author ideas, and um, this sort of like critical and ethical, uh, critical and equitable uh, pedagogy stance, and sort of like in the middle of that, 
and how is it that again, like through valuing epistemic heterogeneity, we can really uh, attend to and leverage students uh, or learner sense-making repertoires. Now, as I said before, especially with the challenge, like, this is not always true, or this is not always happen with uh, inequitable, um, in science education environments uh, with emerging bilingual students. And I think that it's important to zoom back and, and understand a little bit of kind of like the political, sociopolitical context that we exist in in relation to this. Like first, I think it is important to understand that for over a hundred years, the US has had an attitude and policies uh, towards assimilation, right? So like we want to assimilate people into speaking English uh, and, and that has made it to where Multilingualism or bilingualism is usually frowned upon, except for some kind of people, right? Like we've made the decision that we want some people to speak multiple languages, but not everybody, or there are some languages that are more valuable than others. And I think that some of these attitudes have been codified in language policies, even at the state level, you know, not that long ago, Massachusetts, Arizona, and California had very clear restrictions around bilingual education, right? So we are sending a very clear message about what is it what it is that we value and how is it that we organize schooling around this sort of like myth of english fluency or english proficiency in a way that i think it's often caught uh sort of like uh, or embodied in the categories that we use or the labels that we use for students typically that are english centric right so the even the 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 label ell emphasizes the learning of english over anything else right this is who you are as a person this is who you are in this school or even you know, sort of like the, the proficiency-centric labels that had been faded out, thankfully, uh, where we think about people's uh, proficiency as limited or, or not, right? But again, like, what is it that these categories, what work are these categories doing in terms of how we position students, uh, not just in science learning environments, but in schooling more general? And I think that these kinds of, of, of attitudes and policies track what has happened in science and engineering fields where you know, for thousands of years, people <laughs> were in relationship to the natural and design world in their own ways of communicating, right? And, um, and at some point around sort of like the 1500s, we decided that uh, you know, Latin was gonna be the way to move forward, but it wasn't until kind of like the, um, the expansion of empire during the 19th century, where English started becoming the language of science and engineering, right? And so much so that uh, even today, uh, a lot of the publications that are valued or the journals that are valued and recognized are English specific uh, journals. So really, you know, we're erasing the contributions of scholars who speak other languages and see the world in a different way just because of this assimilationist perspective, right? Um, and, and again, like I think that to me, this is tightly related to sort of like these remedial approaches of, of science learning where we're saying that you know, if you don't speak English, if you don't speak academic English, if you don't speak sort of like a, an English version of the specialized discourse, then you're not invited to participate in this kind of like sense making. And, um, and that's crappy. That, <laughs> I mean, come on, right? Again, like this is not where we are. And moreover, you know, like when I think about, again, as a scientist, like, you know, as I was saying, joking with Christina, as, as astronomers, we have very uh, highly technical language like black hole and dark matter, right? But what, uh, and that, that was supposed to be funny because it's really like dark matter, right? But, but, you know, what we forget about is that these specialized discourses have an origin and have a purpose. So I want to kind of like demystify it a little bit and sort of like remind us all that these specialized discourses are created to serve a need, right? Uh, that we don't, as scientists, we don't start with the vocabulary and then find a question that we go towards. And, um, and again, sort of like how is it that these, they are useful, they serve a purpose, uh, but they are not given to us in a glossary from the universe. You know, in fact, most of the terms that we use in science, they derive from everyday Latin and Greek. It's just that, again, from a Eurocentric perspective, we've decided that these are the real scientific languages and we're gonna be building on them. So I love the, 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 um, the example of the mitochondria because it sounds very, very, um, you know, sort of like fancy, but it's just a thread of granules. Right, it, it, all of a sudden when you start getting into the etymology, it's not that fancy, right? So 
you know, what decisions are we making or, or what messages are we sending when we say that this is what you need to do in order to be able to make sense of a natural world, right? So like, first of all, like, what are we saying about what it means to do or learn science or engineering, right? So from an epistemic perspective, as, a, as an educator, like, what could we be missing out when we don't push forward uh, or trying to really understand like what is behind the use of that term. And again, from an equitable perspective, it, you know, what are we doing um, in terms of positioning people as more or less capable of engaging in this kind of sense making? And you know, again, to come back to this graph, which I really like, when we look at the practices and the sort of like the communicative and linguistic demands of what it means to do you know, planning and investigation or developing models, you know, there are some practices that have very explicit and high demands and some that have implicit, uh, implicit demands, but at the end, we're not going to be able to engage in this kind of work only by using the quote-unquote right word. So this is going to take a lot more um, kind of, again, that epistemic heterogeneity in terms of communication. Uh, to be able to get there. And I, I think that this is why I'm really, really attracted to the concept of translanguaging, which you know, takes uh, what some bilingual researchers have um, named the solitudes, where registers and languages are considered to be um, ontological entities in and of themselves. They are categories, there are things that exist apart from anything else, right? So the idea that if you are a quote unquote bilingual speaker, you have an English speaker in your head and a Spanish speaker in your head. Or if you are a scientist, you have a scientist in your head and just sort of like, an, an, and I'm gonna say it, a normal person because we're not that normal, <laughs> and a normal person in your head, right? And it says, well, why are we making those distinctions to begin with? Like there is, and, and, and there are multiple definitions of translanguaging, but I'm drawing specifically from the work that Ofelia Garcia and Ricardo Otegi have been doing, where they're really trying to explode they're trying to question the boundaries that we put around ways of communicating and asking ourselves, like, what is the sociopolitical work that those boundaries are doing in ways that may be harmful for our understanding of how communication actually happens? It's not as simple as having, again, the solitudes in your head and negotiating them. It's a whole lot more complex than that. So what they've proposed is that let's think of instead of a linguistic repertoire that has resources that we can associate with these like named registered, named ways of communicating or, name, uh, or even languages, that they serve different purposes at different times, but they don't exist in separation from each other. And what does it mean when we create uh, spaces where this kind of like translanguaging happens where there is no, none of that kind of like policing around communication and we can bring multiple ways um, of kind of like, yeah, sort of like talking into coordination for sense making. But to me, talk, written and spoken language, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go far enough, right? It, these are not the only ways that we use as humans to communicate. So I really like some of the work that has been doing, uh, that has been done around including multiple modalities into this repertoire. So instead of having a linguistic repertoire, we end up with a semiotic repertoire where you bring in all of these linguistic and paralinguistic communicative resources under one umbrella. And really, you know, it's, it's up to you to decide what you're going to use when for what purpose, right? And for those playing the home game, this is Niels Bohr, you know, talking about, so, you know, he proposed the model of the atom around sort of like the mid 1900s, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And here he is in Copenhagen talking about the model of the atom and he's gesturing around like kind of like what the atom looks like, right? And this is not to say that because scientists do it, then we should do it, but just kind of like, again, really questioning of what decisions are we making around who is allowed to use what in what purposes, right? Or for what purposes in what settings? So, you know, again, sort of like when, it, when I bring all of these into coordination, I try to think of like, well, what should a learning environment look like? And I'm going to share with you uh, two studies that I have done. One in a K-5 learning space um, where I was a, a collaborator of a teacher. Well, actually, first, second, and third grade teachers, but I'm going to be showing work from the third grade uh, where students were exploring the production of sound and um, and you know, before I came in or I started collaborating with a teacher, 
uh, they had set up an expectation that students were going to share spontaneously, they were going to listen to each other, they were going to justify their ideas in all of the content areas, not just in science, right? And then something else uh, that's important to point out here is that all of these students had been classified as ELLs by the district, and I'm using that label, I'm, I'm saying that explicitly, the district classified them as ELLs. Um, and we had about 14 students representing 10 countries and nine different languages, I think, at the third grade, if I remember correctly. And the way that um, we kind of like adapted the, the sound unit was that we wanted students um, first to like get a sense of like what happens when you change the length of a ruler in terms of the, um, not only the sound, but the vibration. And they were working in pairs and then they collected uh, their evidence and then we put them together in a massive table and we started looking for some patterns. And then the idea was that students were gonna uh, use that information to build their own string instrument. Um, based again, sort of like how the length of a ruler affected uh, the kind of vibration that was produced. So for this, um, I collected, it was mostly uh, qualitative data, uh, mostly video recordings of students, also some student produced artifacts. I also kind of like kept some track of, of, of the meetings with the, of the, of the teacher as well as some journal entries. And I approached it specifically again from a kind of like a qualitative perspective and thinking about interaction analysis. Uh, relying mostly um, on the video, which I logged and I broke into different uh, like time intervals. And then I started kind of like from a qualitative perspective, inductively looking for the ways in which the students were referring to their uh, observations and then what, what, what were they reasoning about. So just to give you kind of like a little bit of a sense, again, you know, I really care about mechanistic reasoning. Um, and to me, the question was like, how is it that the students were promoting length, tension, and frequency of vibration, right? So they were saying things like this string is shorter than the other one, or this string is looser than the other one, or this string is faster than the other one. But also like what were the communicative resources that they were bringing to bear as they were making these kinds of claims? And um, I'm kind of like giving it away a little bit here, but sort of like specifically using the ting, the tang, and the tong as a way of talking about um, connecting the, the string to the, the physical property of the string to the characteristic of the sound. So um, I'm, let me share some video with you to kind of like get a sense. So about, again, like, you know, we're about to build the instrument. It's about one minute in. We pull out the instrument and we say, today we are going to be working on these guitars. And then uh, Gustavo, who's a Brazilian American student, um, says, oh, I know what that sounds like. And then, you know, so we, we give it to him and this is what happens next. There are subtitles in case the, video, the audio doesn't work, but we'll see. Okay, so let's see if I can make the transcript appear. Okay, here we go. So, you know, you can see. So he says, you know, ting, tang, tong. That's interesting. And then he starts connecting it to the first string, then connecting it to the second string, to the third string. So he's already realizing that the strings sound differently. And then he's using, again, sort of like this, like, onomatopoeia to create a label for the string and for the sound itself. Um, and what's even more interesting, or, or in addition to the onomatopoeia, he's also using his own body to talk about, um, you know, sort of like talk about the scales, right? He's saying ting ting, tang tang, and tong tong. Um, so he's again kind of like building on all of these semiotic resources or the paralinguistic resources to communicate his idea. And when we look at the conversation, the discussion that happened for about 15 minutes, we see that all of the students who participated took up 
the ting, the tang, and or the tong in a way to not only describe the strings and the sound, but also connect to their explanations for why they sounded that way. So this kind of like summary really points out to me the way in which this invented label became useful and accessible for all of the other students who were present in that moment. Um, so much so that, you know, then Georgie, when we asked, like, why does it sound that way? So after we've talked about ting, tang, tong relating to the, I don't know why the subtitles aren't working great, I'm sorry about that. So after we talked about the ting, the tang, uh, and the tong relating to the, I had a problem with this once at NARST where I had practiced my talk and then for some reason it decided that it was just going to show the slides. I'm really sorry about this. I'm not going to use timings. There we go. The moral of the story is don't practice your talk. <laughs> um, so <laughs> um, here we go. So now, now that we've talked about the ting, the tang, the tong be related to the, the length, now, you know, Georgie offers both the frequency of vibration he's attending to and then also the tension, right? And not only he is connecting again the ting, the tang, and the tong to those um, uh, to those properties, but he's also kind of like observing it and he's experiencing, he's plucking it, he's showing not only me but his uh, his peers, and now we're starting to build an even more complex model of like what's happening here in this string instrument, and particularly around the question of tension, uh, Bruno later added, let's see. Third graders. So Bruno is attending to the tension again, right? And and what he's doing here is that he's looking at the tension from two perspectives, right? So like the first part, he's looking at the tightness, and he's able to construct a spectrum of tension of tightness based on this one is tighter than this one and this one is tighter than the other one. But then he turns it around and says, he focuses on the looseness of the, of the string where he's saying this one is more looser than this one and more looser than this one, right? So we see kind of like this dexterity on communicating his experience around the same phenomena, but from different perspectives, again, in a way that he's connecting to the ting, the tang, and the tong. This one sounds tong because it's looser. And what I haven't necessarily, uh, what I haven't told you yet is that at the beginning, the teacher introduced the concept of pitch, high pitch, low pitch, a high sound and a lower sound. And Bruno was the only student who still used that language every now and then. So you can see it here he kind of like added it to the um, to his explanation. The tongue makes a lower sound. And what I love about this is that in this moment, those tongue tongue is not competing with lower, right? So he sees them as being uh, 
um, analogous and complementary to each other. And for the students who were in the room who could understand what lower meant, they still had access to it. But for the students who Tung was more helpful, then they also had access to that sense making. I mean, so much so that when we look at how students refer to the tension, we see that even though they used ting, tang, and tong throughout, not only they used it in conjunction with their descriptions of the tension, right, which makes me think that they su that supported the ting, the tang, the tong supported that kind of sense making, but all of the ways that they described the tension was very much experience on, was very much based on their experience of the tension. How did they talk about it? Do they talk about being loose? Do they talk about being easy? Do they talk about it being hard? And none of this variability interfered in that collective sense making. So, you know, in, in, to me, this poses the question of like how not only these like adjective based um, or experience based adjectives are helpful to students in understanding the problem, but also communicating across and again uh, co constructing this model. So in thinking again of just sort of like epistemic heterogeneity and meaning making, um, we see how students uh, problematize the guitar by connecting, by in interacting with the instrument, collecting some evidence, interpreting what's happening, uh, and thinking about the sound and connecting the characteristics of the sound, the pitch, to the different uh, properties of the, of the string. And in terms of the ways that they communicated about this, sort of like, again, like the, the, the function of the onomatopoeia, sort of like having that label, to refer to the sound, to refer to the string, in a way that supported them to uh, problematize and um, construct that model, particularly uh, using, again, sort of like the experience-based label and even pointing. So to me, this, this left me wondering, like, well, what is the role of gesture in this space as another paralinguistic resource? Which I explored in this second, uh, in this second study, which is a design-based research uh, study that I did in collaboration with a public library. It was an out of school time setting for um, emerging multilingual students at the elementary level, where uh, this happened in 2016. And uh, we met about, yeah, about eight times for about an hour. And really the goal was to investigate electrical phenomena. But to me, again, the, the, the importance is the complexity. So I wanted to move beyond just conductor insulator binaries. And I really wanted students to create a, a, a learning activity where students were digging in a little bit more deeper into electrical resistance and what changes electrical resistance. So I'm focusing particularly in this summer 2016 um, on these like four students, Yesenia and Elia, who were, uh, you know, used resources from English and Spanish. And um, from Tobin and, uh, on Tobin and Grace, who used resources from English mostly, but I also knew that they spoke Japanese and Igbo at home. They were uh, Japanese Nigerian students. And, you know, just to kind of like, give you a sense of what the design process is, of kind of like using um, Bill Sandoval's uh, design conjecture, uh, conjecture mapping logic, just trying to think of like, well, if these are the kinds of communicative practices, practices and sense making practices that we want to promote, what do we need to build into the learning environment? Like, what are the design decisions that we have to make? So if I want students to, again, mo leverage multiple communicative resources, then the kinds of things that I was interested in is like, well, what do I need to do as a facilitator to promote multiple resources being welcomed and valued into the space? Uh, but also thinking about, again, like the students, who is in front of me? Like, what are they going to find useful um, in terms of sense making. And then I, to me, the question is like, well, if this is working, then I should students, I should see students engaging in this, again, multiple uh, modalities and literacies for explaining their ideas about electricity, particularly around electrical resistance of blockages or obstacles or uh, passages. And again, using multiple ways of communicating different registers, languages, even invented words, and again, gestures. And this would be, to me, would be an indicator that we have been able to create a, a learning environment where this kind of work or this kind of sense making, meaning making happen, uh, process is happening. So very similarly, uh, from a qualitative standpoint, uh, or you know, kind of like methodology, I collected a lot of video. Uh, which I then analyzed, uh, but I, this 
Uh, in this particular case, I focused on like discourse analysis. I was really more intentional about communication and focusing on the video, which again, I, I logged, uh, and focusing on students' observations and reasoning. I was really looking for, again, like these like translanguaging practices in a way that I wasn't before, being more intentional about the resources, paralinguistic and linguistic, that students were bringing to bear. And to me, in this moment, I had to define kind of like my unit of analysis being a translanguaging event, which I'm drawing on the work of Stephen Alvarez and Shirley Bryce Heath as a moment where all of these resources are being coordinated, they're being layered uh, for meaning making purposes. So this is not just about socializing, but really, again, problematizing this phenomenon, which I then kind of like quantified and tracked along, uh, along the program. And this is just kind of like an example of what a translanguaging event can look like. So here, Yesenia and Elio are debating what the role of a battery is in the circuit, and they are using resources associated with Spanish. La batería está haciendo energía para que prenda, so, right? so the battery is making energy so that it can turn on. But then they're also writing on a whiteboard because they're going to have to share their ideas with their uh, non-Spanish speaking peers. So I was like, well, how do I navigate these resources? And for them, it's, it's seamless, right? It, like it doesn't, they don't exist apart from each other. So much so that they're thinking about like generates, ponle generates, right? So like how they're going to express uh, that idea in a way that was understandable. Uh, I love this one, but without que, <laughs> the banjo, but without. Um, and then in terms of the gestures I built on the work by David McNeil, uh, where I look for the kinds of deictic gestures, so like the pointing, the touching as a way of kind of like disambiguating what we're talking about in a space. Uh, for example, touching the battery when we're talking about uh, a circuit. Uh, thinking of these, that's a poor color choice, look better on my screen. Um, iconic gestures that were supposed to be imitating um, movement or motion. So for example, running your hands along a wire to um, explain or simulate what the electricity is doing. And also these kinds of like metaphoric gestures that are more abstracted in terms of concepts um, that we may ourselves not be able to see. So these are the kinds of things that I was looking for. Um, so with these in mind, yeah, so actually, I, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read this transcript here and see if you're able to ascertain what is Grace's model of electric flow based on what's there. So it says if you connect them, it bounces off here, and it goes all the way over here and they're, they're the same. It's hard. It's really, really difficult to know what's going on. So, so let me show you a video of what Grace was saying and what she was doing while she was saying that. If you connect it like Okay, so she has the wires in front of her. She's able to create the circuit. And so when we look at the speech in conjunction with the gestures, we see that, you know, she says we connect them and then she kind of touches the battery, right? So like she connects them here and then it bounces off. So she's moving her hands independently from each other, right? So we're already starting to get a sense of exactly like how she thinks electricity is moving through it. Um, and then they're the same here, right? So the idea that they combine at the light bulb. So this model is very common. It's called the clashing currents model, where the electricity leaves uh, the battery independently, and then they combine and they meet there together at the at the at the light bulb. And even though it's not necessarily like the canonical understanding of what's happening in 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 circuits, it's still the kind of thinking, the kind of reasoning that we want students to engage in, and Again, like that layer of the paralinguistic resources, the layer of the gesture gave us access to her thinking in a way that if we would um, 
prevent that from happening or say this is not uh, acceptable, then we would not be able to sort of like ascertain like how she's thinking about um, electric flow. And I, I don't show it here, but so much so that then she's able to counter her brother's model who says that it's kind of, uh, it's, it's very sophisticated. It's clashing currents, but with a phase, right? So it's not that they move together, but they move at different times through the wire. But then she says, no, that's malarkey. It makes no sense. <laughs> um, and, but yeah, again, sort of like, with, she had a very clear model and reasons to support it in a way that this in and of itself may not show. And then we moved into thinking about, uh, again, sort of like how changing the properties of a conductor. So this is what uh, we call in physics sort of like the um, extensive properties of electrical resistors or conductors uh, affect how much electricity can flow through it. In this specific case, we we're changing the thickness of a conductor. And uh, Yesenia um, noticed that when she made the line thicker, the light bulb was brighter, and then when you made it thinner, the light bulb was dimmer. So when I asked her, you know, what she thought was happening here, she said, um, so the translation is here if you need to read it. <clears throat> La energía puede ir más rápido en este lado que en este lado porque está muy chiquito y hay menos espacio para que la electricidad vaya. Y aquí hay más espacio. Entonces está más fácil que vaya acá pero a veces se atora aquí y no puede volver a la batería. And then I ask her, and what about this one, this thin one? And she says, it will go slower and it might, it might take longer, it may take a longer time to get through, or it could, or it would be harder for the energy to go through. So I want to point out a few different things here. The first one being that <clears throat> she's attending to different aspects of what changing that um, the spacing or that um, yeah the thickness of the wire does or the conductor does. One, um, you know, she's she's obviously making a comparison between the two kinds of conductors. There's a white conductor and then there's a thin conductor, and then she's thinking about it in terms again of like space and how much like space there is for it to move through, but she's also thinking about a potential resistance, right? Like there is something that happens that it just makes it to where it takes longer and when it takes longer, it just makes it dimmer. Um, and again, like this, for, this is a, a third grader <laughs> thinking about electrical resistance in a way that goes beyond this sort of like conductor, um, conductor insulator binary. And she's already identifying these two dimensions. But in addition to that, or and what I want to point out here is that when she is saying her model in Spanish, she's using estar, which in Spanish we have two versions of the verb to be. We have ser, which is permanent, and estar, which is temporary. So to me, her choice of verb tense makes me think that she was aware that, or she was thinking about this as a variable. As long as this is wide, as long as this is small, this is what the outcome is going to be which is very sophisticated thinking in a way that we would not be able to get from her English explanation without more words or without sort of like unpacking it more because the to be version is both permanent and temporary. So this would be here, I have no way of knowing whether she's saying that for right now or forever in a way that I can um, in Spanish. So, you know, again, the, the students were um, able to construct these sort of like models of electric flow and these models of like what is it that's happening inside the wire that regulates how much electricity can flow through it, but also recruiting all these semiotic resources to make themselves understood. Um, and not just to make themselves understood, but sometimes even open up a layer of complexity that we may not have anticipated by focusing exclusively on written and spoken versions of English registers um, and specialized discourses. So to me, like, well, what do we do now? What's happening next? So again, you know, like, I, I just want to point out, you know, like, these are elementary school children doing complex reasoning and epistemic work, leveraging this host of re resources that are often that don't often make it to 
the word wall because they're seen as deficient, because they're seen as unsophisticated, because they're seen as non-scientific. Um, so what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm asking us to do is, as a field, is to sort of like think, like what are the meaning-making repertoires that are coming into our learning environments? And how do our learning theories account for that variability? How do they account for that complexity? And how do we resist this urge to reduce that complexity to narrow disciplinary versions of disciplinary work that may even misrepresent the kind of work that's happening there. How do we account for these like sophisticated reasoning strategies and practices that students can engage in, such as you know like um, modeling from evidence through building on these like semiotic repertoires that again are often for political reasons devalued. <coughs> And what is the purpose or what is the function of a construct like translanguaging that really asks us to look at these boundaries that we set around ways of communicating in a way that sets up hierarchies um, and that have very real consequences, not just in terms of our research, um, but especially kind of like in our research because if our methodologies are not attuned to this kind of complexity, these kind of meaning-making repertoires, then we, there is a lot that we're missing there about not only how students are learning, but how we can structure learning, how we can organize learning in ways that are really transformative. Um, and you know, in terms of, of, of our classrooms, you know, we, we, we've known for a while that you know, this model where students talk to the teacher is antiquated and we really need to be figuring out how do we build or move towards more like student-centered discourse and um, in, um, environments that, that promote this kind of student-centered discourse, but in a way that again builds on their ideas, their interests, their identities, their ways of communicating to really tackle rich and complex questions and problems instead of these Mickey Mouse versions of how many pennies can you put on a boat until it sinks and then we don't talk about why, right? And how is it that again, like as educators, we can identify value, uh, these multiple ways of, of communicating, particularly in these like collaborative learning environments where we promote a sense of community, of a, of a real community of learners uh, with the teachers and with the students particularly in ways that, again, like disrupt these like political boundaries uh, that we have set for ourselves uh, in ways that do a disservice not only to our students, but also to our understanding of the natural and design worlds. So if I were to leave you with like one thing, I think that it's captured very beautifully here in this chapter where it says, you know, like for us, creating equitable learning opportunities depends critically on our skills as educators to see and hear students' ideas and reasoning as connected to science as opposed to being off, talk, off topic or worse, disruptive. And in terms of like what I'm curious now, you know, like I really wanna know what the role of the object is. I was telling Christina about this earlier and I think that you could see it both with the, with the circuit and the guitar. Like the, the object was playing not only a role to help students investigate the phenomena, but also to communicate. So how do I build on theories around post-materialistic communication to like make sense of that interplay or that dual role. Um, I want to expand this work that I did in an out of school environment around electricity and bring it into a, a fourth grade or a third grade. I think that students are capable of doing it. Um, and again, like let's, let's get away from the binary. Let's get complex in thinking about electrical resistance. Um, you know, and, 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 and I think that you know, the question of, again, you know, I understand that specialized discourse serve a purpose, but I don't want that purpose to overtake uh, the other ways of communicating that are meaningful and productive. So to me, I'm really interested, or for me, I'm really interested in like, how is it that we can develop like pedagogical strategies that bring that on, not to substitute, but to be another resource that students can bring on in ways that are meaningful to them. And what does that mean for teacher education? I, I teach the elementary science methods uh, course, which is fantastic, but you know, it keeps me up at night thinking of like, how do I do this in a way that is meaningful to where after 13 sessions, my candidates are going to be ready to do this kind of work. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I'd love to spend the next 45 minutes with you thinking about that or less. So thank you again uh, for being here for the invitation. Uh, and um, yeah, this is time for questions and answers.
Yeah. Um, so, like the, <laughs> I'm trying to put this together into a conjecture map because I've been bitten by the bug, and here I am, right? As a design-based researcher, I have to. I'm contractually obligated. Um, but I think that my logic has been both of immersion into the phenomenon, and then pairing that with evidence of student thinking. So, um, um, just chatting with Christina a little bit ago. I, I go to that book about ignorance, and I try to demystify the work that scientists and engineers do. So we spend a lot of time um, trying to unlearn these stereotypes about what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And then after some critical reflection on that that we can, we can come back to later, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a physicist, so I'm partial to it, but I, I plunge them into an investigation of magnets and thinking about models of magnetism. And all of a sudden, they see that they can magnetize a nail. And when we bring a, a bolt cutter and we cut the nail in two, all of a sudden, we have two magnets in a way that they did not, they did not expect. So over an, an extended period of time, they realized that they had some ideas about how magnets work. They, they understood some things more, or maybe they reminded themselves. But there were experiments or investigations that they hadn't done in ways that challenged their ways of thinking. So when we, when we reach that level of, hmm, that's funny, then we go back and say, oh, remember, this is what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. So um, this is my first time uh, using a questioning, a driving question board, and it was particularly productive because actually I had one student say, I didn't think I cared about magnets until I realized how many questions I had, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, oh, well, this is what we're here to do. Like, this is, it's about posting questions. And then, Let's think about your questions. Let's think about your process. And something that I, I do a lot in, in, in PD um, with the guitar especially is that I, I bring the guitar and I give it to them and say, try it out, talk about it, see what you think. And then we make a list of ideas and ways of communicating. And then we pl I play the video. This is where the student evidence comes in. And then I make parallels and say, oh, you see, look, it's not that different. You have, more, you have more experience. You have more knowledge. But it's really not that different in principle, right? So when we so through that kind of like process my goal and and i don't and I, I don't necessarily talk about how this is a justice move at the beginning but i want them i want them to realize that they're not that different from their students and the kind of activity that they're able to do is the exact same kind of activity that their students can do um, so to me, having that interplay of the content, but not for the sake of content, but more of like the engaging in the practices and the experience, and then seeing it reflected in different learning environments uh, has been, I think, productive. But this is what I'm hoping the next four or five to 10 years of my career to look like. <laughs> so come back to me on that. But yeah, but I think, I think that's it, yeah. I think especially at the secondary level, is helping students or candidates see that just because they know more facts doesn't mean that they know more science or that they're better at science. And pushing them to that edge of that limit, again, to me, has worked. Thanks, yeah, it's, but I don't know. I, I struggle with that. Yeah, to be continued. Yeah? So staying on the topic of teacher preparation, I went from like being happy 
saw something, they were like, oh, that makes sense, because now if I can get a teacher that has a bilingual understanding, mm -hmm. or at least the capabilities of, like you said, I, I know some Spanish, but I, I didn't know the, the difference between stare and this. So there are those kind of nuances to me make, oh my God, so a teacher who's like that can better support their students, but then I said, oh, that's awesome, so we can customize students to teachers that understand the women, but am I not just putting Spanish teachers with Spanish students, and mm -hmm. am I segregating again? So I went from being super happy, oh, this is, oh no. So, because it let, let's say let's say I, I'm a native English speaker teacher, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. It puts me in a disadvantage, or maybe not a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, how do you think about your free service teacher coming to you? Some of them bilingual, some of them are not, mm -hmm. and some of them are going to be in different classes, right? So different. So you you mentioned your classroom had like nine nine different languages, right? It's impossible to find somebody who. But I'm saying, is there some sort of thought about customizing? teacher per class composition mm -hmm. without it being infringing on, let's just put the Spanish students with the Spanish teachers and the uh, you know, Arab students with the Arab teachers, because that's not what we want, we're about. So I'm trying to figure out what's the happy medium in between. Yeah. Um, I, you know, that, that's exactly my gripe with a lot of sort of like bilingual-led research when it happens in, especially kind of like in the Southwest where they say 40% of the students were monolingual English speakers and 40% of them were Bilingual Spanish speakers, and then there's this other other twenty percent. It's like, oh, well, what, what happened, right? Uh, like, what do you do to, for them? Um, I don't have a good answer to that question, so I, I'll tell you what I wrestle with. Um, I don't think that there is a way of of customizing, other than promoting world languages, uh, just sort of like in general. I think that you know this is a, this is a societal and a policy question where we really need to uh, do better at understanding. The, the reasons for why a person may speak multiple languages. Um, however, however, I think that there are ways of, of promoting multilingualism in a space, even if you yourself don't participate in that, in that sort of like in that language, right? Um, and I think that we, that's the thing that we should be doing. Um, even and this is and and this is it may sound contradictory, but even if that locks us out from the process as educators, and and that's an uncomfortable tension, but I think it's a necessary one because of the constraints that you've pointed out, and I think that. So I'll give you an example. I was working on a on a first grade, very similar to the third grade. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to help a mouse cross a river. Some students build bridges, some students build boats. Uh, these group of, of three Brazilian, uh, Brazilian girls were working together on a boat. They put it on the water, they tested it, it didn't work, it kind of like tipped over. And the, 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 the logic of the, of the unit was that, you know, eventually we were gonna fix it, but it, they, they pulled it out and then immediately they kind of like huddled and they together, fix it in Portuguese, which I kind of understand, but don't, but don't, not really. To this day, I have no idea what they said. Right. But they were able to put the boat back on the water and it worked. So, so as an so educator, yeah. Yeah. You, should, you, you want to have the confidence of having the students. If they're chit chat, whatever language they're chit chatting, yeah. productive science chit chat, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Like you said, it's very daunting to me. Maybe not at the lower level, but if, if I'm a high school teacher, yeah. and there's a few students talking something I don't know, that's a 50-50 chance they're talking science, a 50-50 they're talking about something else. Sure. It's, it's a very frightening place as an educator. Yeah. I want to give them their autonomy, but what, do I just study like nine different languages? Or yeah, I mean, I think that there, are, there may be ways of, of kind of like getting, getting access into the conversation in a way that doesn't feel intrusive, right? So when, then in that case, when I said, oh, you know, can you share with us kind of like what your logic was behind the redesign? And then, you know, they summarize it in some kind of way um, I think that that's a way for me to have uh, to like understand like what the conversation was about, um, and maybe they kind of you know mess around a little bit, and maybe they didn't. So, I, but I, I don't know it. And again, that's the second. You know, it's it's different at the secondary level, um, but actually, you know, there's work in in PER in physics education research that shows that that kind of like off time is actually particularly productive because it 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 works towards. Uh, group cohesion, uh, trust. So, I'm not. I mean, I'm not making an argument necessarily for letting students kind of like just get completely off task. But, but I don't know. I, I think that 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 trust 
and knowing like when to step in and when to step out and know when to um, to live with the discomfort and when you can find ways of getting around it or at it from a different way that doesn't feel intrusive it's kind of like what we should be doing but again come back to me in five years and I may have a more refined <laughs> answer to that question uh, yeah in the back Um, I did not do that as an instructor because um, part, of, part of my role in the school at that moment was to support educators sort of like move away from that and understand um, what we may be doing implicitly or explicitly when we say that's not the way to talk about it. Um, I did have a partner um, who it was a difficult process. And it was a difficult process for good reasons. I think for her, she understood the ways in which <clears throat> herself as an immigrant, she had been marginalized for speaking with an accent or a different language. So she, wanted, she didn't want her students to experience that. So to shift the, the, the focus away from what do we celebrate? Do we celebrate sounding away or do we celebrate sort of like the idea or the reasoning? was productive, but it took about six to seven months. Um, and you know, it, it's long hard work again because of, of good reasons. Um, I think that there are ways of, of being initiated into the specialized discourse. Um, you know, I think that we kind of have a responsibility. No, we don't kind of, we do have a responsibility of opening up the culture of power because we understand that even though I want to demystify science speak, I recognize that it has currency in the world. So I do want my students to understand that. I also want my students to understand the function of that, right? So from a social linguistic, from a person, a person centric approach, like why do we generate these ways of communicating in ways that could help us communicate more efficiently or in a different way. But I, but I also don't want to put them up in a pedestal and say, we need to get up here because, you know, as we were talking about earlier, like learning the culture of power without questioning it and dismantling is just assimilation. And while I'm very proud of being an astrophysicist, like that's not the kind of image that I want people to walk away with. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that there are ways of, of saying, well, you know, we, we call it, we call, some people call it pitch. And if you were to go outside of this classroom, they may not understand the ting tang tong because they weren't part of it, so they may understand pitch. But you, I mean, like like Bruno, to me, Bruno is kind of like the poster child of, <laughs> metaphorically and, and, and literally, um, where this this kind of like layering of resources, where we don't, we don't necessarily distinguish as long as they're making sense to us. So yeah, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question that I'm struggling with, yeah. Katie, you had a question? Um, well, um, um, I'm having my, my candidates read Sandra Harding and, and Doug Medine and Megan Bang's work. Um, I'm, you know, sort of like the chapter uh, that, um, that I, I pulled out from the NSTA book that uh, Christina Bryan and, and Cindy wrote. Uh, I, th I think that, I mean, I, I drop them deep into theory and start kind of like reading a lot of that work that deconstructs or does the work of kind of like pulling the curtain and say, um, who make these decisions? Like whose questions are we chasing and how are we making sense of them? So um, I am I'm planning a unit on um, 
eco-justice where I'm being a little bit more explicit about indigenous ways of knowing uh, from a local perspective. So it's, it's not easy, especially with 13 sessions at two and a half hours each, right? But, but I do try to bring in some of those kind of like science and technology studies conversations into the space um, where I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to do, undo some of that, some of that work. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if it's successful yet. Um, I, I did something similar with my graduate seminar in the fall and I had a, a, a graduate student curse me the other day because she says, now I can't stop seeing inequity everywhere. <laughs> and then I said, thank you and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I don't know. I think that having, having those like frank conversations and to me, it's, it's not about, you know, against following on, on, on Sandra Harding's work around strong objectivity. It's like, it's not about, it's not about tearing down or replacing. It's not, it, to me, it's not a question of like struggle in that way, but rather how is it that these complementary, how these like perspectives are complementary and actually give us more understanding and more relationship uh, to the natural and the design world. Um, yeah. Daryl, you had a question? Yeah, so I used to teach in Miami where like most of my students were bilingual, at least if not multilingual. Um, and it was like this really beautiful space where like it didn't matter if I spoke Spanish or not because like they could explain to each other, they would then explain to me, and like we would get to this nice consensus level of like everyone understood what was going on. And it didn't matter what language it was in. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering about like like the only reason why that was happening was because we were in this community space where like this was promoted and that was great. Um, but how do you support or create kind of supportive communities in spaces where your bilingual students are like far outnumbered? Um, and how do you promote that? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't tried this yet because I haven't had I haven't come across or I haven't inserted myself into those kinds of spaces. But um, I like the work that um, a colleague from UW, Emily Machado, was doing out in, in Chicago, where she um, was getting a sense of how, her, how a monolingual um, elementary school teacher was promoting multilingualism in his classroom, um, even if he himself only spoke one language. And they did things like uh, read alouds uh, with students and with families, um, pairing students uh, who spoke the same language and celebrating that. And in a way, sort of like similar to the question, so like not in a way that is intrusive, but instead reframing um, the, the sort of like the politics of the space in terms of like how we communicate. Um, having text on the wall that um, refers or kind of like exemplifies uh, multiple languages and also having not just read alouds but moments where um, sort of like multilingual students would share their thinking in their language first and then they would say what they mean or sort of like a rough translation. Um, so so yeah I, I, I haven't tried that out yet and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that that's going to happen because of where I am geographically. Um, so I don't know, I, I'll get back with you, but I think that, um, yeah, I think there's really good work out there uh, around critical bilingualism, the people who have like tried that out. Or, I mean, if there's anybody in the audience who has like tried that, like I'll love to hear, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so you work with three third of these teachers that are a little more valuable and they're just mm -hmm. going into the classroom. So what, um, what suggestions do you have when we're doing a PD and we only have teachers for like four, you know, like four full day sessions? Um, and um, how do you try, or I guess what are your suggestions of how to try and get some of these ideas mm -hmm. into um, the PD mm -hmm. in a way that's not, um, you know, like preaching or like you really want them to understand their students and to value and leverage those ideas. Um, but you have such a, you have so many things to do around like whatever it is and then you want to also try and get these ideas in. What are your suggestions for mm -hmm. that type of Yeah, um, so um, I, I think that the, 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 I mean, the short contact is, is the necessity and it's sort of like the model that we have. Um, I think that um, 
what I like about research practice partnerships is sort of like having more of a sustained engagement and building that trust and that rapport. I mean, if you have a small, a short amount of time with people who you already know, it's a little bit easier, but we, you know, we've all sat at PD sessions that are really boring and you have no idea like who's talking at you and why, right? So, so that in and of itself can be pretty challenging. So that's one thing. I think the other thing is, to, 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 to me and sort of like the groups that I've been part of, like we actually put equity at the center. So like this is, everything that we do, we relate to why, why this, is, this is better, it's more just, it's more equitable. And I think for us, the key has been to talk about equity not as this thing that you do that's extra, but rather understanding how a lot of our teaching practices and schooling have been organized in ways that that privilege or benefit like specific students, right? So like we're already doing this work. It's just that it's invisible. So we need to sort of like reframe kind of like what we're doing. So having that conversation has been helpful. Um, and again, just sort of like similar to uh, as I was telling David earlier, bringing in when we, when we talk about you know, argumentation practices, when we talk about asking questions or developing investigations, make sure that, to me, the question is like, are you seeing those sense-making repertoires that you might be missing? So like that, to me, it's, that's the first step. Like it's not, just, it's not just being aware that you may be missing something, but start to develop, you know, kind of like strengthen that muscle of becoming attuned to these kinds of things that you might have missed before. And it's gonna take a while, and it's not gonna be perfect, and there will be things that you're gonna miss, but that's okay. That's sort of like what learning looks like, right? Um, so, but, but to me, it's, it's, it's starting there. I mean, and I think that, you know, I, I, again, like last night he was referred to as Papa Freire, and I think that, you know. So that, that connection between that thought and action, right? So like praxis, you know, it's not just about thinking about it, it's actually about doing the thing. And, you know, something that I, that I appreciate that came out out of our collaboration with um, Seattle Public Schools was even like, what does an equity project look like? You know, when we talk about equity, there's sort of like capital E equity and justice, right? Which can be pretty overwhelming, quite frankly, because the world is broken in many, many ways. But there are bits and pieces that you can commit yourself to working on. So if it's about racial justice, you know, like what is the little bit of thing that you're gonna do in your classroom in terms of representation, in terms of cultures, in terms of pedagogies, in terms of learning how to listen to your students. You know, if it's around ableism, right? Like how are you gonna redefine and reframe your physical space that allows like support students learning? If it's around gender uh, justice, you know, like what are you gonna do? So like, like, you know, we don't expect, or, for ex or at least when I work with my pre-service teachers and we go through the talk moves from the science primer, for example, I always say pick two that you're gonna focus on for the next two months. And this is what I want you to get really good at. And then you're gonna pick another two and then just try it out. So I, I think it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's saying, well, what are you gonna be attuned to? What are you gonna pick? To me, again, it's sort of like, it's a sense of making repertoires. It's like, there's a lot that you may be missing that you're not realizing because of your expectations about how they're gonna be communicated or how they're, or how they're gonna be connected to the students' lives. So becoming attuned to that, it's, it's, it's the first step, thinking about it and developing a kind of like that, that muscle. Yeah. I, I'm wondering about when you get, when you're thinking about assessment in this world, how you're holding students' use of their like multiple communication resources against this expectation that you also stated that there is value in them like picking up these scientific ways of communicating their ideas. Like how, like when you think about assessment, like how do you weigh those in like making sense of where students are and what they're taking? Is getting rid of standardized assessments an option? <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that's a, I, I don't. That's a really that's a really hard question. Um, I know that Tracy Noble out of Turk has done really really important work um, about thinking of um, you know just sort of like assessments and the role that they play. Uh, just now, I was exchanging emails with Eve Mans and T.J. McKenna around like what do we do with MCAS, the Massachusetts sort of like standardized assessment. And that, you know, it's a nut that we're trying to crack. Um, Guillermo Solano Flores of Stanford has done a lot of work around sort of like rethinking assessment in ways that are more equitable. Uh, so there's really good people on the case. 
Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't necessarily figured it out. Um, I, I think that if there is a way of including kind of like a multimodal component is like a one way. I mean, and I think that we are, I mean, based on the work that, you know, is happening here at CREATE, I think that there is, there are good opportunities when we, when creating 3D assessment that promote multiple modalities. That could be a really important way of kind of like, um, reframing or restructuring the power of written and spoken word, especially like uh, specialized discourses in that space. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just imagining walking into sort of like, you know, the DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Instruction or Education in Boston and be like, hey, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Yeah, it's racial linguistics is a thing. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard. So that and that's why you know sort of like related to the question earlier. So like I, I do think that there is there is a, and it's important to consider how we are supporting our students kind of like be successful in these kinds of of spaces because this is how they're going to be measured. But let's not that drive kind of like what we do and how we resist in this in this space. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, Danny Caballero posed that question to me about five years ago, and I'm, I'm still, it keeps me up at night still. <laughs> um, so thank you for bringing it up again. Um, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. So, you know, I, um, so I, I think that, you know, to me, to me, it's always about pulling back the curtain, right? So like how we as disciplinarians, like when we think about, to me, okay. Um, how am I thinking about this? Right. So even though it's an undergraduate program, you, it's still kind of like you're being you're being apprenticed into a profession, right? So I think to me, we're doing a disservice to our undergraduate population to make them think that this is just sort of a collection of facts or formulas or whatever that you're going to use. And then only if you go into graduate school, that's when you start kind of like rolling back and saying, oh, this is actually how, you know, the sausage is made. I, you know, I, I, for the life of me, I spent 10 years in, in physics and astronomy, and it wasn't until I left that I started kind of like realizing like how like things actually happen, right? So, so I think, you know, being a little bit more honest about the, 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 the practices or the professional practices that we kind of engage in as a disciplinary community is really, really important. And again, there's this, um, <clears throat> Ellie Ox has these beautiful papers from about 20, 25 years ago, just looking at the ways that physicists talk about <coughs> uh, particles and what they do, right? So th that would be a really interesting paper for you know, physicists or scientists to read. And again, becoming more aware of these kinds of things that we do, that, um, that you know, for, for, for very clear reasons we've decided are acceptable and some not, right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, I also think that there is a lot of linguism that is kind of like baked in to our um, kind of like science departments, or at least the parts of the departments that I've been part of that, you know, if you are a student and it's mostly sort of like East Asian students who come to the STEM departments, they are literally kind of like isolated or segregated into ESL courses or these other kinds of like spaces where they are not only separated, but, or, you know, sort of like English, uh, students who are learning English as an additional language, they are, it, 
it's very clear that you have to have a certain degree of kind of pro proficiency or fluency in order to be able to be a full part of like the community, right? So investigating or, or in, in interrogating and disrupting those segregationist practices along sort of like language ideologies, I think it's also really, really important. In terms of, of I mean, and I think that in terms of the of large lectures, I think so much of it is already there. Like we, we use so much, especially large lectures, it's like we use so much multimedia or like multiple modalities. So if we can develop a little bit of that kind of like meta-linguistic awareness about the ways that we communicate, and even at the assessment level, like what are we privileging when we say that you have to like either tick a box or I think that that will be a good, that will be important steps to take. Um, so I don't know, it's having more conversations with our colleagues in CNS and be like, hey, have you thought about the way that this plays out or, I don't know. Right, so, well, I think we're at the end of our time. So I wanted to thank Henry, we've got a special small gift. And oh. <laughs> thank you for Thank coming. you, yeah, no, thank you all, oh, this was fun. And um, yeah, this is my email, this is my Twitter. If you have any other questions or ideas or pushbacks, please don't hesitate. Um, I, I welcome them all. So thank you again for coming. It's so much fun. And thank you again for 